Now, the college of complexes will now come to order. I'd like everybody to, uh, you know, just kind of keep the conversations down. The college of complexes consists of the following format. The first part is a brief announcements period. Second, our speaker will speak. The third part will be our question and answer period, where we have questions and not for our speaker. And then tonight, we will, yeah, go ahead and turn it down, Charlie, a little bit. For, yeah, the, the volume control on all the way on the left of the top thing. Just notch it down. And our, the rest, the, the end of the thing will be our intensive Q&A session. Where we have a, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll go through this again. It consists of the following format. A brief announcements period. Second, a, you're going to sit up. Okay, just... All right. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'll have to start again. You know what? Brief announcements period. A the speaker will speak. There'll be a questions period. And then at the end will be our infinite rebuttal period. You don't need to hear me screw up again. I'd like to now introduce our speaker, Justin Tucker, who's chairman of the Libertarian Party of Chicago. You know, come on up and just start speaking. There's a little bit of an intro here, but let's just get you on the line and on the road. Come on, give him a hand. Thank you, guys. Uh, as he just mentioned, my name is Justin Tucker. I am chair of the Libertarian Party of Chicago. I uh, want to thank the College of Complexes for hosting me. Uh, we Libertarians also believe in free exchange of ideas, and I'm honored to be here this evening, and I want to thank everybody for coming out to you this presentation. Earlier this month, the Libertarian Party of Illinois had its annual convention. We selected our candidates for 2018. For governor, we selected uh, retired Navy veteran and activist Cash Jackson. For lieutenant governor, we chose entrepreneur and IT consultant Sanj Mohip. Our congressional, or excuse me, our comptroller candidate Claire Ball will be the only certified public accountant in the race. <laughs> our treasurer candidate Michael Haney has a solid back background in finance. Steve Dutton, our secretary of state candidate, is a longtime libertarian activist who wants to privatize license offices and automate services. Bubba Harsey, our attorney general candidate, received his uh, JD from American University in D.C. and helps small businesses in his practice. For our candidates to get on the ballot, we will need 25,000 signatures compared to the 5,000 the established parties had to collect. To ensure we survive any challenges, we are aiming to collect over 50,000. If you want to put an end to the blatant corruption, uh, if you want to help give the Illinois elector another choice in November, and if you're registered to vote in Illinois, I kindly ask you to sign one of our petitions, uh, which we got one right here. I also got one in the back, so if you are registered to vote in Illinois, Please sign one of our petitions. I'll also be collecting signatures to get on the ballot as a Libertarian State Rep candidate in the 4th House District. I'm running on a platform of cutting spending, reforming pensions, legalizing cannabis, slashing business regulations, and putting the gears in motion to give statehood to Cook County. If you're registered a registered voter in the 4th Illinois uh, District, uh, please also sign one of my petitions as well. I'm here this evening to discuss the ideas and history of the libertarian movement from its, root in the, from its roots in the Enlightenment through the present day. I'll cover, uh, in this presentation, I'll cover key individuals and their beliefs, and I hope that you leave this evening with a more nuanced understanding of libertarianism. Uh, I'm particularly indebted to the books Radicals for Capitalism uh, by Brian Doherty and The Libertarian Mind uh, by David Bowes. Both are terrific books and, good, in and uh, good introductions for those interested in learning the ideas of libertarianism. I also want to thank Secretary of State candidate Steve Duttner for lending me his copy Radicals for Capitalism uh, while I prepared this talk. Also, uh, libertarianism.org and mises.org have tons of archival information for free. And I'm also grateful for the public domain, which includes uh, Make Project Gutenberg and LibriVox uh, possible. 
So let me begin by asking, what is a libertarian? Does anybody want to take a stab at what a libertarian is? He's the one guy who wants to keep the government out of your bedroom and out of your wallet. All right. <laughs> Any other? Anybody else want to take a stab at telling me what a libertarian is? You really don't want to hear it. Well, let's hear it, Charlie. You don't want to hear it? Yes. Yeah, Charlie, well, I just said it. One who believes in freedom, liberty. All right. Anybody else? Uh, All right. Merriam-Webster defines libertarian like this. One, an advocate for the doctrine of free will. Two, A, a person who upholds the principles of individual liberty, especially through of thought and action. B, capitalized, a member of a political party advocating libertarian principles. Uh, I agree with these definitions. Uh, the first known recorded use of the word libertarian is in 1789 by an, in an essay by Englishman William Belsham called On Liberty and Necessity, and that's what the first definition there describes. In 1857, French anarcho-communist Joseph de Jacques used the word libertaire in a letter to fellow French anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon. In the letter, de Jacques argued that liberty and equality of the sexes were related. In 1958, the Jacques later started a journal called Les Libertaires, Journal du Mouvement Social, and libertarians subsequently became synonymous with anti-capitalist anarchism in Europe. What is libertarianism? Google de uh, Dictionary defines libertarianism like this, an extreme laissez-faire political philosophy advocating only a minimal state intervention in the lives of citizens. I too agree with this definition, except that I disagree that it's extreme. Economist and libertarian theorist Murray Rothbard said from his book For a New Liberty, libertarian creed rests upon one central axiom, that no man or group or group of men may aggress against the person or property of anyone else. This may be called the non-aggression axiom. Rothbard goes on to explain that this axiom implies support for civil liberties and opposition to war, positions considered leftist in today's political spectrum. He also explains that it implies opposition to government interference and property rights in the free market, things which would be considered extreme right wing. Rothbard continues, quote, But the libertarian sees no inconsistency in being leftist on some issues and rightist on others. On the contrary, he sees his own position as virtually the only consistent one, consistent on behalf of the liberty of every individual. Gary Johnson, uh, the Libertarian Party's uh, nominee in 2012 and 2016, sums it up like this. Libertarians are fiscally conservative and socially they don't really give a damn as long as you don't force your social whatever it is on anyone else. Many libertarians identify as left libertarians or right libertarians. Many other libertarians have no regard for the left wing or right wing political spectrum, myself included. In the case of Gary Johnson, this quote was a pithy way to explain the philosophy to the American electorate in the context of today's political uh, paradigm. Now the non-aggression axiom, or the non-aggression principle as it's more commonly called, is not a new idea. In fact, it's been uh, articulated one way or another by many political philosophers and theorists. 1689, John Locke said in the two treatises of government, being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm, no one ought to harm another life, harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. In 1816, Thomas Jefferson said, no man has a natural right to commit aggression on the equal rights of another. And this is all from which the laws ought to restrain him. In 1851, Herbert Spencer wrote, 1851, by the way. <laughs> he wrote, Every man is free to do what he wills, provided he infringes not the equal freedom of another man. In 1859, John Stuart Mill wrote, The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Ayn Rand, who I'll discuss later, wrote in an essay, The precondition of a civilized society is the barring of physical force from social relationships. In civilized society, force may be used only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. So what are the roots of libertarianism? The roots of libertarianism are, are, uh, the roots of libertarians are in the classical liberal tradition. 
Like a lot of modern day political theory, we go back to English philosopher John Locke, one of the greatest Enlightenment philosophers, uh, and whose two treatises on government is one of the classic works of political philosophy. Here are a few quotes from Locke. The government is not free to do as it pleases. The law of nature stands as an eternal rule to all men, legislators as well as others. Here's another quote. The end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. For in all the states of created beings capable of laws, where there is no law, there is no freedom. For liberty is to be free from restraint and violence from others, which cannot be, where there is no law. But freedom is not, as we are told, a liberty for every man to do what he lists. For who could be free when another man's humor might domineer over him? But a, but a liberty to dispose and order as he lists his actions, <coughs> persons, possessions, and the whole prop and his whole property within the allowance of those laws under which he is, and therefore not to be subject to the arbitrary will of another, but freely on his own. Let me give you one last quote from Locke this time regarding property. Every man has property in his person. There is no body that is any right but to himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatever then he removes out of the state of nature hath provided and left in it, he hath mixed with his labor with and joined it to something that is his own, and thereby makes it his property. So Locke believed that liberty was innate. The purpose of the law was to preserve liberty, and we own ourselves as well as our labor, and we can justify justly acquire property from our labor or from mixing labor with the land. Another classical liberal influence on libertarianism is Scottish economist Adam Smith. His best known work is an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, which he described as a simple system of natural liberty. The wealth of, nat the wealth of nations introduced the concept of the invisible hand, where in acting in our self-interest benefits society. He wrote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard of their own interest. So I have a need. I'm thirsty. The brewer makes needs to make a living to satisfy his own needs. Because he wants to keep my business, he provides me with a desirable product at a price I find satisfactory. And both of our lives are better through this voluntary exchange. <clears throat> The, founding fa uh, the founders of the United States of America also had an influence on the libertarian movement as well, specifically the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. They were influenced by Locke and Smith and instituted some of those principles into the founding of our country. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter and abolish and then institute a new government. After they declared and fought their independence, they sought to secure liberty against a powerful central state through the Articles of Confederation and then through the United States Constitution. The Constitution was drafted by James Madison and it created, in theory, Three branches of government, their power separated with checks and balances. It also uh, listed, the, uh, it also defined what each branch of government does, giving Congress a list of specific enumerated powers. The Constitution also gave itself the power to amend, and fearing that the new government they created could be as tyrannical as the British were, James Madison introduced a series of amendments called the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments. These rights guarantee freedom of religion, freedom of speech in the press, freedom of assembly, the right to bear arms, protection from unregional uh, searches, and searches and seizures, speedy trials, no cruel or unusual, pun and, uh, uh, cruel and unusual punishments, etc., etc. Another classical liberal that influenced the libertarian movement is French economist and statesman Frederick Bastiat. His radicalism uh, can be summed in this quote. The state is the great fiction through which everyone endeavors to live at the expense of everyone else. In his masterpiece, The Law, Bastiat explains what the purpose of the law is and rails against his perversion of the law, including what he called legal plunder. He writes, Life, liberty, and property do not exist because men have made laws. On the contrary, 
It was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that men that caused men to make laws in the first place. Here again we see the influence of Locke. He also writes, legal plunder can be committed in an infinite number of ways. Thus we have an infinite number of plans for organizing it. Tariffs, protection, benefits, subsidies, encouragement, progressive taxation, public schools, guaranteed jobs, guaranteed profits, minimum wages, a right to relief, a right to the tools of labor, free credit, and so on and so on. All these plans as a whole, with their common aim of legal plunder, constitute socialism. I'm going to have to quit quoting the law right here because I just recite the, uh, recite the entire book and it's an incredible read and everybody in here should read the law. Like Joseph de Jacques, uh, Bastiat also engaged in a debate with Jean-Pierre Proudhon. This, uh, this time on the subject, uh, the debate was interest. Let's now shift from the Enlightenment, uh, classical liberalism, to the anarchism of the 19th century on our way to libertarianism. We'll start with lawyer, entrepreneur, abolitionist, and essayist Lysander Spooner. Spooner differed from, the, differed from the classical liberals on his view that government should protect rights through consent of the governed. Instead, he believed that the state itself was illegitimate. Here's how he looked at it, quote. So what are you doing? But whether the Constitution really be one thing or another, this much is certain. That it has either authorized such a government as we had, or it has not been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. Spooner launched his own postal service, which was called the American Letter Mail Company, which was able to deliver mail more efficiently uh, than the government monopoly had. Govern the company was then litigated out of existence. From his tract, No Treason, uh, Spooner wrote, But this theory of government is wholly different from the practical fact. The fact is that the government, like a highwayman, says to a man, your money or your life. And many, if not most taxes, are paid under the, compulsor, uh, the compulsion of that threat. But the robber is nonetheless a robber on that account. It is far more dastardly and shameful. The highwayman does not pretend that he has any rightful claim to your money or that he intends to use it for your own benefit. He does not pretend to be anything but a robber. He has not acquired imprudence enough to profess to be merely a, quote, protector, and that he makes men's money, he takes men's money against their will, merely to enable them to protect those, infatu uh, those infatuated travelers who feel perfectly able to protect themselves or do not appreciate his peculiar system of protection. So Lysander Spooner believed basically taxation is theft, and the government is a merely a less dignified highwayman. Another prominent anarchist to influence the libertarian movement is Benjamin Tucker. He was the publisher of the anarchist journal called Liberty, and he translated the works of anarchists like Proudhon, uh, Bakunin, and Max Stirner into English. Here's a quote. Aggression is simply another name for government. Aggression Invasion, government are all incontrovertible terms. The essence of government is control, or the attempt to control. He identified four monopolies that, uh, four monopolies enforced by the state that he hoped anarchism could re uh, remedy: the money monopoly, the land monopoly, the tariff monopoly, and the patent monopoly. All four, which still exist in one form or another today. Tucker called himself an unterrified Jeffersonian an anarchist, and a socialist. Unlike Bastiat, who in France was able to see what the people who called themselves socialists put into action, Tucker had favorable views on socialism, mainly because he still subscribed to a more classical definition, worker ownership of the means of production, that allowed him to reconcile being an anarchist and a socialist. Of course, this was before the rise of the Soviet Union and the association of socialism with authoritarianism. He also held to a more classical definition of capitalism, wherein the bourgeoisie exploits the proletariat using the arm of the law. He was also staunchly against communism, which he called state socialism, to distinguish it from the anti-statist socialism, which he called anarchism. Tucker writes, there are two socialisms. One is communistic, the other solidarian. One is dictatorial, the other libertarian. One is metaphysical, the other positive. One is dogmatic, the other scientific. One is emotional, the other reflexive. One is destructive, the other constructive. Here we see Tucker is using the word libertarian in the context first articulated by de Jacques in his letter Perdone. 
as, as a synonym for anti-capitalist anarchism. While modern libertarians will disagree with some of Tuck, uh, Tucker's beliefs, like the labor theory of value, he nonetheless made a lasting contributions to the ideas of liberty. Another 19th century influence on libertarianism is Henry George, the founder of Georgism, and a huge influence on what we what is now known today as geo-libertarianism. George believed in the free market because it brought wealth, yet poverty still existed. He also believed that men had a right to the to land the same as he would have the right to air. But land titles prevented people from access to the land, a similar criticism made by Benjamin Tucker. The solution is what is that uh, landowners pay single land on tax. He explains, quote, The tax upon land values is, therefore, the most just and equal of all taxes. It falls, upon, it falls only upon those who receive from society a peculiar and valuable benefit and upon them in proportion to the benefit they receive. George has an influence. Uh, George had an influence on the early progressive movement and libertarians alike. Journalist Albert J. Nock, another influence on libertarianism, was gratefully influenced by George. Here's a great quote by Nock: "The practical reason for freedom is that freedom seems to be the only condition under which any kind of substantial moral, moral fiber can be developed." We have tried law, compulsion, and authoritarian of various kinds, and the result is nothing to be proud of. Nock was published in many publications, including The Atlantic and The American Mercury, founded by H.L. Um, Mencken, who I'll discuss momentarily. He was also the editor of the first incarnation of the magazine The Freeman, which would be reincarnated a few times, and would include works by Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises and Milton Friedman. <coughs> Pardon me. His most famous work was Our Enemy the State, which was not only not only an influence on libertarianism, but William F. Buckley and the modern conservative movement. A contemporary of Nock and libertarian influence was uh, H. L. Mencken, who was one of the uh, one of the most famous journalists and social critics of his day, spending most of his career at the Baltimore Sun. He's one of the founders of the magazine American Mercury, American Mercury, where he wrote this: "Laws no longer made by a rational process of laws are no longer made by a rational process of public discussion. They are made by a process of blackmail and intimidation, and they are executed in the same manner." He wrote elsewhere: "All government, in its essence, is a conspiracy against the superior man. Its one permanent object is to oppress him and to cripple him." The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself without regard to the prevailing superstitions and taboos. He also commented on the prohibition of alcohol that I think we can all appreciate here in light of current drug prohibition. None of the great, boon, none of the great boons and ursifrux excuse me, that, we are, uh, <laughs> that we were to follow the passage of the 18th Amendment has come to pass. There is not less drunkenness in the Republic, but more. There is not less crime, but more. There is not less insanity, but more. The cost of government is not smaller, but vastly greater. Respect for law has not increased, but diminished. Locke and Macon were part of the liberal establishment of their times, but their opposition to Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal set them apart a bit from their contemporaries. Liberalism, which originally was a philosophy that upheld liberty and individualism, was now beginning to mean government expansion and intervention. They would be considered in retrospect what is now called the Old Right. Murray Rothbard, writing of Knock and Macon, said, The Old Right was, if anything else, an opposition movement. Hostility to the establishment was its hallmark, its very lifeblood. The winds were blowing one way, yet Knock and others remained steadfast in their beliefs. Another journalist coming to prominence around this time was Is Isabella Patterson who spent 25 years as a critic at the New York Herald Tribune. In her most famous work, The God of the, of the, God of the Machine, she wrote, Men are born free, that since they begin with no government, they must therefore institute government by voluntary agreement. And thus government must be their agent, not their superior. And such, the least practical measure of government must be the best. Anything beyond the minimum must be oppression. Ayn Rand praised her book, saying, it is a document that could literally save the world. 
the God of the Machine does for capitalism, what Das Kapital does for the Reds, and what the Bible did for Christianity. Would you repeat that book again, please? The God of the Machine by Isabel Patterson. Patterson's friend Rose Wilder Lane was another writer uh, coming up around this time period. She was the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who the Little House on the Prairie series, who wrote the Little House on the Prairie series with Lane's help, it is said. Her book, The Discovery of Freedom, uh, was her most famous work. She wrote, Freedom is the nature of man. Every person is self-controlling and himself responsible over his thoughts, his speech, his acts. Lane would also mentor uh, to lawyer Roger McBride, who became heir to, Lo to the Little House series and produced uh, the television adaptation. And he became the 1990, excuse me, 1976 Libertarian Party presidential nominee. Nock called Lane's and Patterson's respective books, quote, the only intelligible books on philosophy of individualism that have, ever, that have been written in America this century. Nock, Macon, Patterson, and Lane were all the last of their kind. American individualists trying to preserve an ideal that was on its way out in the first half of the 1900s. Now this is uh, where the uh, now this is where we the libertarian movement, kind of as we know it today, comes into fruition. Uh, in Radicals for Capitalism, uh, Brian Doherty names Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, Ayn Rand, Murray Rothbard, and Milton Friedman as quote five people without with whom there would be no uniquely libertarian ideas or libertarian institutions of any popularity or impact in America in the second half of the 20th century. I agree, and I'll take a look at each one. And I'll start with Ludwig von Mises. <clears throat> like others we've already discussed, he considered himself to be a liberal, saying, quote, the goal of liberalism is the peaceful cooperation of all men. It aims at peace among nations too. When there is private ownership of the means of production everywhere and when laws, the, tri the tribunals, and the administration treat foreigners and citizens on equal terms, it is of little importance where a country's frontiers are drawn. Mises was born in Austria to a prominent family and attended the University of Vienna where, Vienna, where he graduated in 1906. While in college, he first discovered Austrian economist Karl Menger and the idea is what be known as the Austrian School of Economics. One such idea from the early Austrian school uh, include, uh, includes the subjective theory of value, where price is determined not by the amount of labor going into a good, like Tucker and Smith believed, nor by the pr any of the properties of the good. Instead, value is determined by how much importance individuals place on a desired good. Basically, how much will a, somebody buy something, the price they're willing to pay. He made one of his uh, first contributions to Austrian economics with the economic calculation problem, articulated in his works, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth and Socialism, both released in the early 1920s. He wrote, without calculation, economic activity is impossible. Since under socialism, economic calculation is impossible, under socialism there can be no econo economic activity in our sense of the word. All economic ch change, therefore, would include operations the value of which could neither be predicted beforehand nor ascertained after they had taken place. Everything would be a leap in the dark. Socialism is the renunciation of rational economy. In 1927, his book Liberalism, which he criticized socialism and fascism, was published. He wrote, as the liberal sees it, the task of the state consists solely and exclusively in guaranteeing the protection of life, health, liberty, and private property against violent attacks. Everything that goes beyond that is an evil. A government that instead of fulfilling its tasks sought to go so far as to actually infringe on the personal security of life and death, freedom and property, would of course be altogether bad. Mises, who had worked uh, for the Austrian Chamber of Commerce and was also an advisor to Otto von Hosberg, uh, he did that before he left Swiss for Switzerland in 1934, where he got married and taught at the Graduate Institute of International Studies. In 1940, he and his wife fled Europe uh, because of the war and the growing fascism and landed in, uh, and landed in New York. 
He was a visiting professor at New York University for 24 years, starting in 1945. He was a founding member of the Mount Perlin Society, where Hayek, Friedman, Karl Popper were founding members. And that was an economic forum that continues to meet to this day, starting in 1947. His most famous work was Human Action, published in 1949, a utilitarian defense of the free market braced based on praxeology, the study of purposeful behavior. In it, he wrote, A man who chooses between drinking a glass of milk and a glass of solution of potassium cyanide does not choose between two beverages. He chooses between life and death. A society that chooses between capitalism and socialism does not choose between two social systems. It chooses between social cooperation and the disintegration of society. Socialism is not an alternative to capitalism is an alternative to any system which men can live as human beings. So Mises considered himself a liberal and continued to make a distinction between liberalism and socialism, unlike American liberalism, which embraced interventions in the economy. He died in 1973. Austrian Friedrich Hayek also continued to call himself a liberal and, like Mises, distinguished it from socialism. He wrote, Quote, there is nothing in the basic principles of liberalism to make it a stationary creed. There are no hard and fast rules fixed once and for all. The fundamental principle is that in the ordering of our affairs, we should make as much use as possible of the spontaneous forces of society and resort as little as possible to coercion. It is capable of an infinite variety of applications. He was born in Vienna with a privileged intellectual upbringing. Like Mises, he was alumnus of the University of Vienna and became a friend and protege of his. He was, sympathetic he was sympathetic to socialism as a student, but Mises and the works of Menger convinced him to be a liberal. 1939, he was recognized as one of the leading economic thinkers when he became a faculty member at the London School of Economics and became a British subject in 1938. His most famous work is The Road to Serfdom published in 1943, and it was written as a reaction against the tyranny that led to the hostilities of World War II and how that tyranny came to be. He wrote, quote, To undertake the direction of economic life of people with widely divergent ideas and values is to assume responsibilities which can, which can commit one to, you, to the use of force. It is to assume a position where the best intentions cannot prevent one from being forced to act in a way which to some of those affected might appear highly immoral. It is true that even if we assume the dominant power to be as idealistic and unselfish as we can possibly conceive, but how small is the likelihood that it will be unselfish, and how great are the limitations? In 1950, he came to the University of Chicago, where he influenced Milton Friedman, and, be, and uh, began to influence what we known as the Chicago School of Economics. 1974, he and fellow economist Gunnar Myrtle, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics for, quote, their pioneering work in the theory of money and economic fluctuations, and for their penetrating analysis of the interdependence of economic, social, and institutional phenomena. Hayek died in, 19, in 1992 in Germany, and continues to not only have a profound effect on libertarians, but also the American and British conservative movement as well as expressed by William F. Buckley Jr., Ronald Reagan, and Margaret Thatcher. He, was not, he didn't consider himself a conservative, still insisting he was a liberal. Even as libertarianism was becoming, was becoming to be synonymous with the classical liberalism he believed in. Perhaps the most famous uh, libertarian of all time is Ayn Rand, who is also unfortunately the libertarian straw man. How could she not be considered uh, one, since she wrote works with provocative titles like The Virtue of Selfishness? She summed up her political philosophy known as objectivism simply like this. Metaphysics, objective reality. Epistemology, reason. Ethics, self-interest. Politics, capitalism. She wrote of capitalism, quote, In a capitalist society, all human relationships are voluntary. Men are free to cooperate or not, to deal with one another or not, as their own individual judgments, convictions, and interests dictate. She was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1905 to a comfortable upbringing. After the Russian Revolution, the Soviets took her father's business and thus began her disdain for socialism and communism. 
She did receive an education, but came to America in 1925, staying with her relatives in Chicago before heading to Hollywood to make it as a picture, to make it in the pictures as a screenwriter. She eventually found success as a, no uh, as a novelist with the publication of The Fountainhead in 1943, which inspired many with its themes of individualism. Her fourth novel, Atlas Shrug, sets out to explain her philosophy of, of objectivism. It's a dystopian story about the great industrialist artists and thinkers who go on to strike in protest of the government's increasingly tyrannical control of the economy. Here's a passage from the novel's climax, climactic speech. <laughs> Quote, the only proper purpose of government is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence. A proper government is only a policeman acting as an agent of man's self-defense, and such may resort to force only when those who start the use of force. The only proper function of this government are the police to protect you from criminals, the army to protect you from foreign invaders, and the courts to protect you and your co to protect your property and contracts from breach and fraud from others, to settle disputes by rational rules according to objective law. Though libertarians were very much attracted to her work, she particularly did not like libertarians. She wrote, quote, for the record, I shall repeat what I've said many times before. I do not join or endorse any political group or movement. More specifically, I disapprove of, disagree with, and have no connection with the latest aberration of some conservatives, the so-called hippies on the right, who attempted to snare the younger and the more careless ones by, of my readers by claiming simultaneously to be followers of my philosophy and adv advocates of anarchism. Anyone offering such a combination confesses his inability to understand either. Anarchism is not irrational, excuse me, anarchism is the most irrational, anti-intellectual notion ever spun by the concrete-bound, context-dropping, wind-worshipping fringe of the collectivist movement where it properly belongs. So she was kind of a contrarian, and even, even people she liked, she did not like. <laughs> uh, after Atlas Shrugged, she focused on writing uh, exclusively about philosophy and economics and lectured across the country. She died in 1982. And she remains controversial to this day, even among libertarians. Next up, uh, we'll discuss Murray Rothbard, who I introduced at the beginning of this presentation. Rothbard was born to born in New York to Jewish immigrants in 1926 and was influenced by the old right growing up, but he became greatly influenced by Mises during his days as a scholar. He received his PhD from Columbia University in 1956 and was paid by the Volkner Fund to write the book Man, Economy, Estate, which was a textbook influenced by Mises' human action. He began teaching at the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute in 1966 and from 1986 to his death was the S.J. Hall Distinguished Professor of Economics at the Lee Business School at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He was a prolific writer on economics and political theory. He was also an activist as well, collaborating with individuals from all over the political spectrum and was an early organizer of the Libertarian Party. He was a, he, he was a populi, popularizer of the word li, uh, libertarian in its modern sense, coming to mean a believer in natural rights, free markets, and capitalism. Later in life he reflected, quote, One gratifying aspect of our rise to some prominence is that for the first time we may, in my memory, we, our side, have captured a crucial word from the enemy, libertarians had long been simply a polite word for left-wing anarchists. That is for anti-private property, that is for anti-private property anarchists, either of the communist or syndicalist variety. But now we have taken it over. He was also founder of anarcho-capitalism, which he elaborated on in the books, in his books For a New Liberty, The Libertarian Manifesto, and The Ethics of Liberty. He wrote in The Ethics of Liberty, quote, the state has arrogated to itself a compulsory monopoly over police and military services. The provision of law, judicial decision making, and the mint and the power to create money, unused land, the public domain, streets and highways, rivers and coastal waters, and the means of delivering mail. The state relies on control of the levers of propaganda to persuade its subjects to obey or even exalt their rulers. 
Rothbard went on to found the Cato Institute and Ludwig von Mises Institute before passing away in 1985. The most influential libertarian when it comes to affecting policy was the pragmatic Milton Friedman. He wrote, quote, political freedom means the absence of coercion, by, of, uh, of, coercion of a man by his fellow men. The fundamental threat to freedom is power to coerce. Be it in the hands of a monarch, a dictator, an oligarchy, or a momentary majority. The preservation of freedom requires the elimination of such concentration of power to the fullest possible extent and the dispersal and distribution of whatever power can be eliminated, a system of checks and balances. He, like Rothbard, was the son of Jewish immigrants. After his studies at Rutgers and the University of Chicago, he worked in government as an economist. In 1946, he got his PhD from Columbia and began teaching at the University of Chicago, filling himself with the university until 1977, formulating the tenets of what would be known as the Chicago School of Economics. In 1962, his book, Capitalism Freedom, brought him to prominence. In it, he wrote, quote, a liberal is fundamentally tearful of concentrated power. His objective is to pre preserve the maximum degree of freedom for each individual separately, that is compatible with one man's freedom not interfering with another man's freedom. He believes that this objective, that this objective requires that power be dispersed. He is suspicious, suspicious of assigning to government any functions that can be performed through the market, both because the substitu this substitutes coercion for voluntary cooperation in the area in question, and because by giving government an increased role, it threatens freedom in other areas. Starting in 1966, he had a long uh, long-running column in Newsweek, giving his views a much larger platform. He was an advisor to Barry Goldwater during his 1964 campaign, and advised politicians throughout his career, including a stint as a member of President Reagan's Economic Policy Advisory Board. Like his mentor Friedrich Hayek, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976 for his, quote, achievements in the fields of consumption analysis, monetary history, and theory for all his demonstration of the complexity of stabilization policy. In 1980, he and his wife, Rose Freeman, published the book Free to Choose, which was later adapted into a PBS series. In 1996, he founded the Freeman Foundation for Economic Choice, advocating for school vouchers and other educational reforms. Regarding libertarians, he said, quote, I am a libertarian with a small L and a Republican with a big R. I'm a Republican with a capital R on the grounds of expediency, not on principle. <laughs> Though he liked calling himself a liberal, he did also embrace libertarian as a, as a term to describe himself. Though he veered away from the GOP on many issues, including drug prohibition and LGBT rights, he supported the Republican Party out of pragmatism. His pragmatism also forced him to confront the issue of taxation. Quote, there's a sense in which all taxes are antagonistic to free enterprise, and yet we need taxes. In my opinion, the least bad tax is the per property tax on the unimproved value of land, the Henry George argument of many, many years ago. Friedman passed away in 2006, and is regarded as one of the most influential economists of our times. With the five previous individuals I just discussed, the essentials of libertarian philosophy were cemented. Let me conclude my presentation with the modern libertarian movement that has flourished since uh, these five people had come to prominence. I'll start with the foundation of the Libertarian Party, the founding of the Libertarian Party in 1971. In 1972, the first, pre uh, the first presidential ticket of John Hospers and Tony Nathan was on the ballot in only two states. They received a vote uh, in the Electoral College for Roger McBride, the heir of Rose Wilder Lane, who became the nominee in 1976. Hospers was the first known homosexual to receive an electoral vote, and Nathan was the first woman and the first... Mr. Speaker, will you please ask the audience to pipe down so those of us who want to hear you can? If you guys can... Uh, uh, my friend uh, Dave is hard at hearing, so if we could. Uh... Why don't you shut up? Yeah. No, come on. One full at a time, please. <laughs> you got it. You got it. It's good to hear what the man is saying. Okay. All right. So, uh, as I was saying, Hospers was the first known homosexual to receive an electoral vote. You can't hear him. 
Nathan no, no, no. was the first woman to, and first a person of Jewish ancestry to receive one. In 1980, the Libertarian presidential ticket of Ed Clark and David Koch, yes, that David Koch, received just over 1% of the vote. Koch later left the Libertarian Party to focus on influencing policy through his lobbying efforts and through the foundation of several Libertarian think tanks. 1988, Congressman Ron Paul was elected Libertarian Party nominee for president with Alaskan politician Andre Maroon. He received just under half a percentage of the uh, half a percent of a, of one percent of the vote. It set the groundwork for his 2008 and 2012 bids for Republican nomination uh, after he went back to Congress as a Republican in '96. In '96 and 2000, investment advisor and author Harry Brown was Libertarian nominee. It was through Harry Brown that I discovered the Libertarian Party and, and immersed myself in the Libertarian philosophy. In 2012, Republican Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico, left the race for the Republican nomination for president and instead won the nomination of the Libertarian Party. For the first time, the LP received more than a million votes, despite a lower percentage of the vote total compared to the Clark Koch ticket. In 2016, Gary Johnson again received the nomination for president with former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld as his running mate. The ticket received over 4 million votes, or 3.28% of the electorate. Mm -hmm. The Libertarian Party isn't the only organization in electoral politics that advocates, that advocates libertarian principles. In 1991, the, libertarian, excuse me, the Republican Liberty Caucus was formed to turn the GOP into a more libertarian organization. Roger McBride, who we previously discussed, rejoined the Libertarian Party and chaired, or excuse me, he rejoined the Republican Party and chaired the organization until 96. Recently has endorsed the campaigns of uh, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, and J Justin Amash. All three are now serving in Congress. Outside elected Politics, libertarians also run some of the most influential think tanks in the United States, including the Cato Institute, the Heartland Institute, the Hoover Institute, and others. <coughs> Pardon me. Despite its, uh, the Cato Institute is especially influential in forming policy because it appeals to both folks on, on both sides of the aisle. Despite the perception it's a conservative organization because of its views on economics, Noam Chomsky and journalist Glenn Greenwald have contributed to Cato publications. Libertarians, more than ever, have a prominence in mainstream media. Reason Magazine is the journal of record in the libertarian movement. Its current crop of editors and writers like Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch are regularly featured in news commentary and appear on political panels. On Fox Business Network, former MTV host Kennedy's eponymous show gives a libertarian perspective on the news and features interviews and panels. She was preceded by John Stossel, who began expressing libertarian views as a reporter first on ABC before moving to Fox Business, ne uh, Fox Business Network and hosting his own show. This brings us to 2018. People are more interested in libertarianism than ever before. We won't know for certain how far the libertarian movement has progressed or regressed in what I think is an unlikely scenario from the two th from 2016 until this November election. I will predict that in Illinois, Cash Jackson, and the rest of the Gold Rush 2018 team <laughs> will help the Libertarian Party exceed 5% of the vote and give us ballot access. I predict the Libertarian Party will continue to make strides in other states. I predict that some Libertarian Republicans will be elected to office, while others leave the GOP for the LP. I believe the needle will be pushed even further and further toward liberty as long as there are bullies and tyrants that interfere that want to interfere in our lives and our businesses. <clears throat> and I'll conclude my presentation right here. I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank the College of Complexes again for hosting me, and I'll be happy to more I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's thank our speaker. <clears throat> All right, uh, Andy, do you want to moderate questions, please? Yep, I'm right behind you. Okay. Uh, By the way, uh, here's all the, uh, if you want to learn more about our candidates, here's all the web information. I'll leave those up for a while before shutting the projector off. All right. Okay. Over here. You got the first question. Okay. Uh, you, thanks for a great presentation. It didn't seem like you said much about the military in the United States. 
So would you give us a, if, if, unless I missed it somehow, would you give us a succinct statement as to what the Libertarians' position on our military is? Yes. Uh, so the Libertarians are uh, believe that um, the military should only be used uh, in defense of your own country. Um, Murray Rothbard uh, and Mises especially were very anti-war. Murray Rothbard reached out to the left during the Vietnam War and uh, tried, you know, to work with the more left-wing factions of that debate. Um, there are some hawkish libertarians. Uh, Friedman started off more of a hawk, especially uh, around World War II. Um, but he, again, believed that it was only in self-defense. Um, and uh, Ayn Rand actually believed that uh, fighting communists during the Cold War was a good thing. Uh, Mo the, the Libertarian Party platform wants basically to bring uh, the troops home, close the bases overseas, and, uh, you know, just not interfere, not be the world's policeman anymore. Thank you. Second question. Okay. Climate change. Climate change. Uh, so, uh, many Libertarians believe that pollution and uh, destroying the environment is a violation of the non-aggression principle. Uh, so s there are many libertarians that do support uh, such measures to protect the environment. Gary Johnson in 2016, one of the ta he supported a uh, he supported a uh, a consum or a uh, carbon tax to offset. Uh, to offset, and that kind of goes back to the Georgist philosophy a little bit, that, that the Georgist influence within the Libertarian Party. You do have, uh, in, in the Kochs, do have a lot of influence, yeah. and they have financed a lot of uh, uh, think tanks that have put out uh, kind of doubt on the environmental issue, but I think most Libertarians believe that uh, protecting the environment is a, is a public good. Okay. Uh, what about collective bargaining? Collective bargaining. I love this question. Uh, the Libertarian Party, and I, I mentioned this. Uh, I, I uh, had mentioned this before. This very body at, during a, another presentation. The Libertarian Party believes in separation of union and state. Um, so uh, they believe that uh, if you if if workers want to organize and they want to bargain with their employer, they have every right to do so. If the employer agrees to such bargains, to such an agreement, then we they would expect uh, that shop owner or boss to uphold his end of the bargain. What we don't support is compulsive or compulsory joining of unions. And I think many libertarians would also support abolishing unions for state employees. Why? Why? Because uh, the government, the people who work for the government don't, shouldn't be lobbying. Well, for one, we don't need government workers. Uh, they don't believe that. And, and also, they shouldn't be lobbying and uh, the government to give them uh, salaries that are much higher than the uh, you know, market rates of similar jobs in the private How much sector. Do they get paid? I'm sorry? How much higher are they? Too much, Charlie. I'm not sure exactly, but I do know that. Well, you uh, don't know, but you just said. Well, I know teachers in Chicago make about seventy yeah. grand a year compared to teachers in other Give states. Give me a percentage overall. What about? I don't. I don't have that data offhand. I'm sorry. So you don't know. You How many don't know questions that. does one person get to ask? All right, that's enough. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to give you that data, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean. No. Uh, who's next? Okay, uh, over here, in the yellow shirt. Will uh, Medicare for All take away benefits from uh, seniors? I'm not too sure. I, I don't know. Uh, I do know the Libertarian Party would be against Medicare for All. Good. Uh -huh. Why? What why? Why? Uh, why? Uh, because the Libertarians, uh, since they, they don't believe that uh, 
that providing health care is a function of the state. What, what is your position on public health programs and public education programs? Uh, again, uh, libertarians usually believe that um, separation of X and state. If the, uh, so in the case of public schools or public health, if the state were to be involved, I think many libertarians would want that to be administered at the most local of levels. Uh, so maybe not a federal department of uh, health benefits, but maybe if uh, Vermont wants to have their own public health care system, let them do it. I don't have to live in Vermont, and I can leave. <laughs> they, they implement that, and I don't want to. Okay. Um, you know, it, I've looked at a lot of the libertarian stuff, you know, but it always comes down to like our, their, your infamous idol, Ayn Rand. She was all capitalistic and whatever until she got cancer and then got government aid to get cured or at least help with it. Well, uh, I can, if in an Atlas Shrugged, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the character's name, the pirate character, uh. he, uh, he started to give back Hank Reardon gold. Oh yeah. And that gold was basically repayment uh, for the wages that was stolen from him. <laughs> so I don't think uh, I, I think that I don't I don't I've heard a lot of this uh, stuff about Rand being older and on Social Security. I don't think is she may be a hypocrite for taking it. I don't know, <laughs> yes. but I I wouldn't think so considering that that money was stolen from her. Already. Let's just get it back to All right, and let me let me hear about your mythical character, John Galt. My mythical character. Uh, Who I didn't write Galt. Um, Rand did. Galt. Uh, I don't want to spoil it, but Galt is Ooh. the antagonist of Atlas Shrugged, and he's the uh, basically the guy who organizes all the industrialists and thinkers to no longer offer their services out to other people and thus creating a strike. <laughs> I got a question. What would, if the Libertarians got control of uh, the majority of the U.S. government, how would you address the billionaire criminal predators that are currently running our government? Uh, well, we would, if they were, if the billionaire, well, for one, the Libertarian Party is against any sort of crony capitalism. We don't want to give favors to billionaires anymore. Uh, we don't get any sort of special privileges we want to give anybody else. So if there are people, uh, if there are billionaires that are committing mass fraud and uh, and are stealing, uh, they, you know, we should, they I feel the jail. government should be justified in bringing those people to justice. Uh, but to go after millionaires for the sheer fact that they're millionaires uh, who have done nothing wrong, I, I don't I don't want to, I don't think we want to target people just... Just because they're rich. Yes. Uh, Charlie, you got a second one? Justin, uh, well actually I didn't plan on the first one. I don't know if that counts. But anyhow, Justin, it's been said here at the college that a true libertarian, under libertarianism, you can sell yourself into slavery. Uh, and you can sell your children. Yeah. Well, um, children, uh, I think that, that uh, that's a very extreme example. I don't think you'll find many libertarians that believe that at all. I think most libertarians look at that and think that that's nonsense. For one, uh, children, you know, everybody has a right to own, to self-ownership. Uh, you And that right is unalienable. So therefore, you can't put yourself into slavery. And you can't sell your kids because kids have rights to, and they can't, even if they wanted to go into slavery, they, they couldn't consent until they got to a certain age. So slavery, libertarians are staunchly anti-slavery. In the back. I was just going to say that plenty of freedom-loving democracies across the planet all endorsed and supporting selling children into slavery over centuries. <laughs> I mean, it happened. Yeah. Do you think we should change that? You think, you think it's bad to sell kids in this slavery? Of course it's bad. Libertarians are 100% opposed to slavery. No, I'm saying... Are you for real? Right. I'm not justifying it. I'm saying that's what's it's already happened question. in history. You just got to him. You got a question? I did not. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Doesn't the, the, consti- the, the libertarians would uphold the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? And doesn't the Constitution and the Bill of Rights hold that you cannot sign away your rights? Uh, yeah, it's called the 13th Amendment uh, to the Constitution. Uh, yeah, I mean, an unal- unalienable, I, I, I don't know exactly which, which uh, clause you're referring to, but the Constitution has outlawed slavery via the 13th Amendment. Excuse me, if a, to, to bring it a little closer to home, if a landlord uh, rents you his property and he says, but I want you to sign that says that I don't have to take you to court to evict you, I can just put you out. Now go ahead and sign that, otherwise I'm not going to rent to you. Even if I signed it, that would be unconstitutional. I'd still have the right to make him take me to court if he wanted to evict me. And it's the same thing for slavery. I cannot sign away the rights that are enumerated to me in the Bill of Rights. Under libertarian theory, you can, though. I'm sorry, what? Under, under libertarian theory, political yes. theory. theory. Extent, this is a flaw in the political philosophy of it. That if you extend the thing, you in fact are totally authorized. This may be some legislation that you're bringing in, but as a political theory, it is totally appropriate within the libertarian philosophy to sell yourself into slavery or your children if you so choose. Uh, I disagree. Uh, I do think that uh, um, there are, if you want to consider uh, maybe like kinky bondage slavery uh, between consenting adults. The previous feature from the libertarian. <laughs> I'm sorry? Advance that concept. Advance that concept? Yes. I'm not going to advance that concept because libertarians generally don't believe that you can sell your children into slavery. I, I don't know where, where you heard that from. Uh, Okay, let's move on. All right. Do, Over do, here. Do, do you think that recreational marijuana is going to result in a lot of potheads and also problem drivers? And Not any more than it already does now because there are already a lot of potheads. In the past election, in the past election, they're talking about legalizing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we, so we, 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 you own your body, so therefore uh, you can put whatever chemical you want into your body as long as you're not hurting anybody else. As long as you're not hurting anybody else. So therefore, if you get really stoned and, and you go out on the road, that's what you would be what about endangering me if other I people. Get hit? My car gets hit. If they kill me. Yeah, and that they, if you're out on the road and you're intoxicated, you are being a danger to other people. No, not me. You're right. Okay. Over and here. we would be against no, that. Uh, how uh, would you apply your efforts to do to China? How would I apply what? Your efforts to China. Uh, are, are you, well, we, I guess we would, what, we would, uh, I guess we would, uh, we believe in free trade and, uh, whatnot. So we would want to maintain a positive relationship with China. Uh, if they want to, if they want to subsidize their labor and all other sorts of stuff, let them do it. The law of comparative advantage, we don't have to subsidize ours, let them do it, and that we keep getting cheap stuff in return. Um, if, if China becomes a threat and is a very aggressive towards the United States militarily, I think we, and they make a move, we are justified in defending ourselves. You got a question there? Yeah, yeah you. Well, I, you know, I was curious about how the libertarians would deal with this situation with Facebook. Uh, apparently, Facebook uh, sold some information to some other, um, whatever. Uh, I think they were a British company. Is this, you know, and then they... I'm not too familiar, familiar yeah, with but, the story. Well, the, what, one of the things I heard today was that the uh, Brits are now going to, or at least Europe is going to start taxing uh. anybody that uses social media about 3% of, of the revenue stream that... Uh, Facebook is happening. But I mean, there's this whole compromising personal identify. How would the libertarians protect that? Uh, libertarians, uh, well, if, if Facebook is going against their agreements, 
that they, uh, which by the way, I've never read the terms and conditions of Facebook, so I don't know what I really actually agreed to. Assuming they're not, it's not, they're not going to sell personal info to anybody. If they did that, then they've breached contract, and there should be some sort of uh, arbitration there. I don't want Facebook to be working with the NSA or the FBI or anything uh, that without probable cause. Uh, I don't think Facebook should be used as a means for surveillance, which it has kind of been. Uh, and if Facebook wants to block people who use their platform, I support Facebook kicking off white nationalists or anybody else they don't want to use their platform. Right there. <clears throat> um, a follow-up to my question on uh, collective bargaining. Uh, how will your, would your response be to the union position that uh, if you uh, uh, allow an individual to vote for uh, a union, but you prohibit a shop from voting for a union, that um, from a practical standpoint, that is a huge handicap for, for collective bargaining. I don't think that shops should be forced to be a union shop if they don't want to be. And I don't think the government should prevent shops who want to be union from being union. Uh, that's, a, that's a decision that's made between the shop bosses, the shop or the bosses and the workers. Uh, libertarians, like I said, believe in separation of union and state. Uh, so that means no labor relations board, no anything like that. Uh, if uh, people, uh, I mean, am I giving you the answers? Or am I, uh, am I, am I getting close to where you're wanting me to go? Um, I, I just, I guess, maybe in a in a snarky way, I would yeah. say, why don't you just instead of instead of saying to allow individuals to form unions, why don't you just say we're not going to allow shops to form unions? Therefore, we're against unions. Uh, it's a lot, well, so are you, I can't, I, libertarians don't want to, if a shop owner, it's its own, if he owns his shop, that's his own will. No, so I if he doesn't, mean, when I say shop, I'm not, I'm referring to, to management. Shop, I'm referring to is the collective group of employees in, at, at the business. If they want, if they strike up an agreement with their boss, they should honor, you know, the boss, and the boss agrees, then that agreement should be honored. Uh, but if you, if, if, uh, if I own a company and my employees say, hey, we're unionized, you got to recognize us, the boss should not be compelled to recognize their authority. Because the boss did not agree to, to that. Well, it's, uh, Bob Manor out what, there. Yeah, what's the official uh, Libertarian Party line on immigration and specifically, like, you know, the wall? Libertarians would be against the wall. Libertarians are generally pro uh, as open of a border as you can, pro as letting in as many immigrants as uh, you can. You letting in, you mean legally, though, right? I mean, sure. Uh, yes, I, I, I pref preferably there might, you know, a, a reasonable procedure that's not too extraneous. Um, of course, libertarians would not be for giving recently arrived immigrants any sort of welfare benefits or anything okay. like that. We want people to come here who want to work. We don't want people to come here to collect a check and not assimilate. Don't you think we should have some control, though, on who's coming in, what caliber of people? Like, so we don't, we're not just getting stuck with all the Certainly. old world peasants, you know? Well, uh, I mean, uh, Milton Friedman and Mises's, or Milton Friedman and Rothbard's uh, parents were dirty peasants that came over in the early 1900s. Uh, so, um, if you're willing to work and you don't have a violent uh, past or you don't intend to do any sort of harm, I don't see any real issue in letting you what in. What about if you're a what about if you're a Lithuanian? Uh, <laughs> Lithuanian. That's Charlie. Private, 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 private joke. joke. Gun control. The uh, libertarians support uh, the right to self defense and the right to own weapons. So uh, gun control though, uh, assault weapons. 
Libertarians support ownership of assault weapons. Mm -hmm. oh. The right to bear arms shall not be infringed. That's a uh, natural right that's to defend ourselves. We have that right. And libertarians do not want to abdicate that right. Okay, let's wrap it up, Charlie. We're getting ready to go. All right. Uh, the, uh, several cases there, Justin, you mentioned natural rights and laws of nature. Uh, those concepts were refuted at the time they were first announced by John Locke. The guys like Jeremy Bentham, the equally uh, of the British Isles, said those simply don't exist. The only rights you have are the rights that are in, a, in the in legislation, in law, such as in the U.S. Code. And I often hear libertarians talking about they don't recognize regular legislation because there's natural law, that they they will only obey natural law. I, I believe you're referring to man-made law. I believe you're referring to negative and positive rights. Uh, negative rights meaning that uh, it's something you have because it doesn't take anything away from anybody else. So for example, me talking up here, I have a right to speak because me speaking doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, if I have a no, right, no, no. if I have a right to uh, say health care, that means that the government has to uh, initiate force to take money from the from people and then redistribute that for. So health care is a positive right because it requires you know an infringement or an onus on somebody else to provide it. As you go along. And that's what they are saying. I'm saying the only laws we have are written down in the thing like the US code. Not just some guy who stands up there and kind of thinks these out. And they can't do that's what that's what they say, a natural law, natural rights. Well, na the natural law is in reference to the natural, the you state of man before guys, government. None of those guys you told me to read are in a, a legislative assembly. Uh, Bastiat was in a legislative assembly. Um, uh, John Stuart Mill was. They are not passing laws. <laughs> well, not now, but they were. Okay, let's get ready to go to rebuttal. Put it together in a good rebuttal, Charlie. Give our speaker a hand. All right, hang okay, on. Uh, I got to change uh, uh, to change batteries in the video. Batteries, so something uh, was a libertarian, but boy, if Jefferson were alive now, the libertarian should kick him out. He went for the Louisiana Purchase, almost doubling the size of the United States. That's not a libertarian idea. He went for an embargo in his second term, as I recall. And boy, that's not a libertarian idea. And the third thing is he was a slave owner. When he croaked, his slaves were sold. I suspect some of them were his children. Of course, uh, hypocrisy is a big problem. I better look in the mirror too, but boy, oh boy, uh, our founding fathers were some people, weren't they? Very good. Who's next? All right, who's next? All right. Yeah, we know. Uh, this is a poem I wrote July 4th, 2008. Stronger Together. Uh, it's based on a picture I got from I belong to USAA Auto Union, and they have a, a financial support report. And on the front cover and on the back cover are 1,512 people lined up for their war in Iraq. That was that's the thing. So this is it. Stronger, stronger together. It's time to get serious about global warming. We need to mobilize. Our security threat is something that we have created against the natural world and each other. Yes, there is strength in being together. And we need to be together with each other and the natural world in new and more peaceful ways. The threat only continues to be there 
that we continue to be unaware of the problems we create in each of our lives. There is work to do that we all need to do. Let us work together against our old habits and ignorance to build a world we can all live in more peacefully. The work we need to do is to listen to each other, become aware that there are no enemies. There's only our limited awareness of how it is possible to be with each other to create a more peaceful world. Uh, I must remind everyone, tomorrow is April 1st, right? Yeah. This is uh, April, this is, uh, what is April? April is Earth Month, right? Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of it or not. Uh, this is a book uh, written by Paul, edited by Paul Hawken, called Turn Down. It's a plan how in 30 years we can deal with this climate change thing. And he gives, uh, he addresses about 100 different ways we can deal with it. Uh, I recommend it. It's, it's still, it's a fairly new book. came out in April last year, but it's still, it fits in right now. We're not dealing with it. And if we don't deal with it by the end of the century, we mean, well, I'm not going to be around, but our, our children and grandchildren are probably not going to be around. We've got to deal with this. This is a long-term issue. Regardless of where you stand on things, you've got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw a bone to the um, left wing tonight. I'm actually going to say something that I think the communists, socialists, libertarians should all, that everyone should really be for. I think just because that the people on the, that the right takes a position on something, it is not a reason for the left to immediately jump on the opposite position. Yet, this seems to be what always happens uh, when uh, North Korea and South Korea had a war. The U.S. took the side of South Korea. Russia and China jumped on the side of North Korea. When we had the Vietnam War, Russia and China were all for uh, North Vietnam while we were for South Vietnam. And whatever position the right takes, the left seems to want to jump on the opposite position. But there are some things that all of of the people should be for. Uh, and I'm talking about a sound currency. Whether you live in a socialist country, a capitalist country, or any other country, the fact is that the money should be sound. Right here in America, when I was a little boy, you could buy an ice cream cone for a dime or a gallon of gas for 25 cents. Uh, today, those things are much, much higher. Why? People will answer with one answer. Inflation. And people are supposed to say, oh, I see, and then go on about their business. But the fact is, the money should always be sound. It should be inviolate. Whether it is Russia, China, the United States, or any other country, the money should be sound, and that is good for everyone. The way it is now, when the US dollar is down, the other countries jump in and buy a lot of products because they get them cheaper. When, uh, West, when Germany's uh, mark is down, <coughs> the other countries jump in and buy a lot of German products because their mark is down. This is the stupidest thing because ultimately it hurts everyone. So all the countries will be better off. Now, the politicians use this to further their own agenda during their time, coming up with the attitude that, well, in the long run, we'll all be dead. They take the, Cain the Keynes attitude. But it's nonsense. If we want, uh, if we love our countries, then the, the money should always be sound. And it's good for everyone. Good for the communists, good for the capitalists, good for everybody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
So is it going to be sound? What is it? Is it? Is it? Gonna what do you want me to do? Make a prediction? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Margaret, and um, I, I asked the question about um, public health and public education, and you, in fact, actually kind of misunderstood the question about public health. At the end of the 19th century, the uh, the people in Chicago dug the Shipman Sanitary Canal that reversed the flow of the uh, Chicago River and made it flow from the lake into the Illinois River or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, Illinois River. And what happened the next year is that the death rate from cholera went down. 300 fewer people died from cholera. Cholera was endemic, which means there was always people in Chicago that had cholera. Really? Now, streets and sanitation doesn't sound like public health, but streets and sanitation is, in fact, public health. If you don't have sewers and you don't have water treatment plants, you have a population that is subject to uh, getting old, contagious illnesses, to typhus, to typhoid, to cholera, to uh, diphtheria, to all of the things that used to be the plagues that we developed immunizations and vaccinations, and we now vaccinate children against, and those are not the major causes of death in children anymore when they used to be, or for that matter, infectious disease being the cause, a major cause of death in the population in this country. We now live long enough that our big deals are heart disease and cancer. So that's one. Second is, um, it, and, and the city, I, I also have to add, uh, cut the, the funds for the public health clinics, leaving a lot of people without any kind of preventative yeah. health care. And, uh, and, and, me, and uh, ability to deal with um, things like sexually transmitted disease and other contagious illnesses that really have a lot of long-term consequences, like syphilis has the consequence that people in, in tertiary syphilis <coughs> need to be uh, put in uh, long-term mental health facilities because they are crazy. So I'm wondering about our current <laughs> um, the, second, the second thing is public education. Now, if, if people in, uh, if, if, if we're cutting funds for public education, obviously. Um, I looked at my handy dandy little phone toy and the average, they didn't really have an average salary for the Chicago public school teachers, but it was something like $70,000. But a beginning teacher earns $50,000. And for a teacher to earn $70,000, they have to have a master's degree in education, which means they have to have a substantial commitment of both time and their own money. It's also true that Chicago public school teachers, on an average, put something between $500 and $1,000 a year into uh, 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 educational material for their classes. I, uh, I was involved in the public school for a number of years when my, when my son went to public when my son went to public school, which we, he got an excellent education by the way, and so um, both my husband and myself were involved in the schools in in the local school council and in fundraising and all of those things for about ten years, okay. and well actually uh, myself longer than that, and um, I have. The, the, being a teacher and trying to deal with between 25 and 30 kids, because they want people to take 30 and 35 kids now, yeah. is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And so they earn every penny of that 70000 if that's what they get paid, which many of them do not. Uh, and, and also, I tell people that, you know, this is uh, a, uh, a, a commitment that our uh, country made to their citizens that they would provide education for the children. Public education was an idea that arose out of the, of, the, uh, of the late 19th century where we had public schools. It said that to be a free and democratic society, we have to have an educated electorate. 
the voucher systems and the privatizations of schools have absolutely shown that they cannot do that as well as the public schools, and they exclude many children who are in the public schools now. <coughs> they exclude disabled children. They exclude children who don't speak English as a, uh, who speak English as a second language or an English language. Or learners, they exclude children who are behavioral problems for whatever reason, and therefore they it, they have failed the children of this country. The voucher schools have, and some of them are totally incompetent. There's a lot of documentation on this, substantial surveys done by the Pew uh, organization, among among others. You're right. You're absolutely right. Okay, sir. Well, the speaker uh, talked about that we're born free. <clears throat> Actually, if you belong to the upper classes, it's, it's probably correct. But if he's born to the working classes, it's just the opposite. For instance, if you look at any freedoms that we have, and uh, the different freedoms that we, we, uh, we now have, if you look at it, we could see it was all brought about to some form of struggle. If you look at the blacks in the United States, the African Americans, it's pretty obvious that what they have now, as little as what they have now, they got it through struggle. And just recently we had the Martha Luther King's birthday, and you see all the struggle we had to go through in order to get a few people on television. They have some token people on television. They have some token people in the arts and schools, so forth and so on. But these are only a small fraction of the total population of the black people in the United States. So we use that as a buffer, that is the capitalist class, uses that as a buffer to show that African Americans have got freedom. If we look at the women's struggle and the franchise to vote, they only got that in the 1920s. And it was a long, hard struggle to get that. If we look at the wars that we've been in, or the depressions that we've been in. Like the, during the <clears throat> 1929 Great Depression, what happened was the United States had something like 100,000 people belong to the Communist Party. If you look at Russia, it was only about 14,000 that belonged to the Communist Party. So Roosevelt, didn't want the capital system to fail, so he brought in these reforms. Not because it was in his head to do that, because of the various struggles that were going on with labor at that time. Some labor unions, like in Flint, Michigan, in the automakers union, were, were uh, occupying some of the plants the auto making plants, and there was uh, all kinds of strikes, there was all kinds of marches, there was all kinds of activities, and Roosevelt was very fearful that we might have another depression. We haven't ended the other depression that was on, and he was not only fearful of that, he was fearful of a revolution in the United States. So actually, we're not born free at all. It's only through struggle. For instance, if a worker went up to a factory owner and asked for a raise, he wouldn't get very far. But if all the people in the factory said, if you don't give us a raise, we're going to withhold our labor, then you get somewhere. In other words, you have a union that unites all these people. Now I think it's something like six or eight percent that belong to unions outside of the government. And with the government, something like eleven percent 
the war to you. In the 19, right down 1930s, towards the 40s, we had one third of the laboring class belong to unions. And when you do have more unions, you get more rights. For instance, they just came out with one of the, the happiest nations in the globe, and they find that Finland and the Scandinavian countries are the ones that are the happiest. <laughs> and one of the things for that, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, about 85 percent belong to unions. So if there's no no union, there can't be a real struggle, and you can't have a decent way of life. Of course, it has to go beyond unions. I think it has to go to socialism eventually, and not any form of capitalism, which is libertarianism. It's just a form of capitalism and nothing more. Thank you. And the happiness is because of lithium. Uh. <laughs> Can I shut this? All right. Um, so uh, I, I want to talk about something that I think is one of the foundational problems of this country, and that is corporations. Um, but I'm going to say it in a weird way. I, I don't think corporations are evil. I think a lot of progressives would say that they're evil. And I, and I would say that a corporation is not evil in the same way that a car is not evil. You would, a corporation is just a tool. And uh, whether something is evil or not, or has bad intentions, or doesn't care about people, the people are driving it. So uh, a corporation is designed to make money. That's its only purpose. It doesn't get in trouble or doesn't get rewarded if it does nice things, if it does things that are the benefit to humankind. The golden rule has been around for, for millennium and corporations have absolutely no no vested interest in following the golden rule. The only way some CEO is going to get in trouble is not if some people are poisoned from his uh, from the company plan. It's not if a bunch of customers die. It's if at the end of the year they look at the profit loss statement and he hasn't made any money. That's the only reason that CEOs or boards, board of directors get fired. They don't make money, and it's even worse now because they're so greedy on Wall Street that you can get, if you come out and say, yeah, I've got a long-term plan to make money, and in four or five years we'll be really healthy, they might get fired because they want the money at the end of that year. They, they absolutely want the money. So I don't think corporations are bad, but the problem is is that with the free market we have legislators who are creating laws <coughs> to protect these corporations. And the corporations are these soulless entities and tools. The, the analogy would be like having uh, roads without any rules of the road and the drivers can do whatever they want as long as they got a pocket full of money to pay for any damages and get out of trouble. It would be chaos. Uh, this whole idea of markets, free markets, and uh, letting them rule the roost, um, I think it kind of feeds into this fear that the population has now of jobs. If you want to scare the public now, you just talk about, oh my god, it's a job killer. You do that, you're going to lose jobs. Well, the problem is, is that for the last 20 years, we've been losing jobs overseas, and why? Is it a free market? Well, they argue it is. But there are all these, we're competing against countries that have no regulations. No regulations to protect workers. No regulations to protect the environment. So, so how are we going to compete against those countries? We can't. That's why we lose all the jobs. And now that the wages have been driven down, We've figured out a way, the corporations have figured out a way to get the companies back because now they only have to pay like 25 or 30 percent of what we were paying back then. So my time's up. So in essence, I would say that uh, if we let free markets rule, 
we're basically going back in time when you had uh, all the robber barons, the oil barons, the steel barons, the railroad barons, uh, where you had this concentration of wealth with a handful of people um, because they were creating jobs, but they ended up writing all the rules and taking all the money and hurting a lot of people. No, because I think I already got something that is going to nail all of you, and that's from a rebuttal I gave back in uh, 2010 at the College of Complexes. Oh, not a video. That's a short, short video, Charlie. It was given here at the college, and I could redo it, but I think it's much better given here. Trust in trade between two parties equally benefiting from the transaction. Yeah. I'm going to stick out for you something that we all have a little bit of faith in. It's called a demand loan from the U.S. federal government. And the reason why it's widely accepted is because of something called what we call a, an article of faith that we trust that will be used as a medium of exchange. And that is the whole basis of a capitalistic economy. When you go in and you look around and say, I want to Buy something this way. Maybe it's going to have the butter. Give her a little bit of a exchange. We trust each other to complete the transaction. Now, if for some reason I went astray or have some fraud, I don't like it. And especially when that fraud gets widespread, nobody likes it. But there are remedies to fraud. <coughs> Number one, might be even a lawsuit. Number two might be excessive government regulations. But how about the best remedy ever? Just don't go to business with them again. And their reputation is staying. Because I'll tell you, nothing will bring a major corporation to its knees than a loss or staining of its reputation and its credibility and its products. <laughs> well, Halliburton is not doing as well as it did. That's because they're, being, that's because they're not a true corporation, Charlie. Uh, government con no big government contracts. Part of the corporate welfare system. I'll tell you something. The best thing that I, the best example of true competition that I've even seen is in the consumer electronics industry, for example. Well, I can take a look at that camcorder that's filming this event right now, which is about the size of a of a hand, and see that it's just the equivalent of the same thing that a um, box camera the size of Well, anyway, you guys get it. I think capitalism delivers the goods. I think it's the best way to bring the nations forward on everything. And it is still global. I still think that market, that globalization, free market capitalism, has been the best thing to bring the nations forward, the world moving forward. And if you don't believe it, I believe the world is in its best place it's ever been in all of history. People are living longer, people are actually raising incomes. And if you don't believe me, look at the, uh, look at the um, information given by uh, Johan Dolberg got a sweep. He's making a whole bunch of new. He's a documentary filmmaker, and he has a philosophy along the lines of uh, Thomas Friedman and others. And uh, he also produces a series on YouTube called Dead Wrong. You just Google him, you're going to find out a lot of stuff. I'll uh, leave it at that. Go capitalism, go free markets, and the rest of you can go to heck. Of innovation. Yeah. 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 You know, all some of the theorists of the libertarian movement. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, first of all, the key to the libertarianism, uh, I was talking with someone, uh, is to eliminate society. All is market. The free market is all, is everything. 
and society must be diminished. The only thing I was thinking about this though, and I spoke here a history on the American Revolution was, and you kept showing your money and hell we got to have a dollar I heard. Uh, the American Revolution was fought, they had no currency, the continental currency was worth about a penny, a, a piece of paper, yet they continued to fight on for eight years and defeat the greatest the greatest army and navy on earth. The society did it, not the market. It was their integrity of people that defeated it. And they didn't need a market. And they didn't need a market at Lexington and uh, Concord. And they didn't need a, uh, to carry on through the war. Uh, that's what I mean. And then we come along with some notions here. I just wanted to bring that in there that the society, it's the cooperative effort that could make society advance. Yeah. Not some kind of exchange stuff. Now you love talking about education, very appropriate. I, I study pioneer life. How did the schools come about? Because the community on the frontier got together. And they used to teach the children among, one mother would teach several children. They said, let's collectively put up a school. I was just reading the history of schools and, on the frontier. And then they, someone would give a parcel of land and then they would come together and they would share the cost and they would donate the materials. No market driven. It was no market. It was the collective will of the people that they saw the merits and value of, of education as a means of advancement, of a quality of life. And that's how they, the schools came about. And the men would show up and build a, build a school. I was, I was reading how they, they went and they put a stove in, they bought a stove and put it in there. And then they got together and collectively hired a teacher. None of this was market driven. This is how true community improvements come about. Uh, now, the, um, uh, the other thing here I heard that was, it was absolutely nonsensical. We no longer have the freedom of association. If the working men and women of a company get together and vote collectively for collective bargaining, the owner does not have a veto over their rights of association. That's an absurdity. No one vested that authority in one individual. Of us to collect, you are just denied. I'm amazed here. The Libertarian Party has denied the, they hate so much. What do you hate people getting us together cooperatively to act in their own mutual interest? The, the law states that people can form unions for mutual protection. You would deny people the right for mutual protection. That's what it states. Two or more people who get together for mutual purpose of mutual pr pr protection under the law is the definition of a union. And I've even exercised that and been in court and won and prevailed on that concept. Because I represented one person I said we are a union at that point. And the judge said, yes, sir, you are, Mr. Paydock. Anyhow, thank you very much. And hey, come again when you guys know that you know the lay of the land. Enjoy it and have a nice holiday, everyone. Where's my coffee? You're going to. It's hard to know where to begin. Um, we have some very smart, very brilliant people in America, uh, very rich, brilliant people. Uh, they funded the Cato Institute and other right-wing propaganda machines, the Heritage Foundation, ALEC. Uh, we've been under attack. Uh, the middle class has been solidly under attack since 1973 when the Powell memo came out. Powell wrote a, uh, a memo to the Chamber of Commerce. Basically, they said, Rich people uh, are not going to be able to hang on to their riches if we have too much democracy and people start to vote to tax the billionaires <coughs> and the excess wealth. So he said, we have to start changing the country back so that it's safe again for billionaire predators. And that's what we've got. And then in 1982 or so, the Federalist Society was formed to groom young right-wing politicians, send them through law school, <coughs> and have them get on the courts and start ruling against uh, workers' rights, people's rights. Uh, I, I talk about something called the Catholic Church Syndrome. That's where if you go into a Catholic church on Sunday and there's 500 parishioners in there, 
and they all know that the priest has been abusing their kids for the last 12 years. And you say, if you say that, oh, by the way, Father O'Malley's been abusing your kids, about half the congregation will say, you're slandering the man. That can't be true. I won't look at the evidence. That's impossible. Get the hell out of here. The other half says, if a shred of this is true, we have a legal, moral, and ethical obligation to look at it. So uh, let me take a quick show. Let's have a show of hands here. Who think the Catholic priests, the pedophiles, were going, doing a good job educating the kids? Get those hands up. They have all kinds of different views here tonight, right? Well, who's with the pedophile priest? Anybody? Okay, look at that. We've all moved. Before you know a fact, you can de debate it. After you know something, and knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. There's no debate on, on uh, prosecuting pedophiles in this country now. There's no debate on a lot of other things in the scientific circle, but we have people that are uh, paid intellectual prostitutes to go on to Fox News and tell us there's no global warming. Or uh, let's reduce the fuel standards for cars and let uh, that'll be good for the environment, more pollution going in. We, there's a, if for those that can see it, it's invisible to most of the rest of us, but there's an invisible, like a, like a little virtual neon sign flashing on and off, hanging above the White House. Trump put it up the day one he got control of the White House. Said, the sign says, if you have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience, and are very rich, and have a criminal background to boot, come on down. We want to you know, help. We, to, we got a position for you in the Trump administration. And likewise, there's a sign there also that says, if you have ethics, morals, and a conscience, don't bother to run for office as a Republican. Those ethics, morals, and a conscience will, if you want to help the American people in any way, shape, or form, you will get disqualified from uh, the Republicans will run, run a criminal against you in primaries. This is where we are today. And it's one of the, the media blacking out these realities is what's keeping Americans in a bubble of ignorance where you have people debating good and bad on issues not knowing what the facts are. Next week, we're going to give you five fact sheets, three, three facts per sheet on the, five, the starting point facts, in other words. We teach seventh graders, in order to solve any problem, you've got to first Start with what you know. Go back to square one and work I'll, from there. I'll get it when I go back So we'll have square one facts, three facts on each of the five major subjects that are blacked out by the press. One of them is the military, one of them is the environment, uh, one of them is our energy situation. You have a question, Charlie? Yeah, your example there is slander. Slander? What slander? There, how do I know if the person is being accurate or merely slandering the police? <coughs> Uh, when the maybe information, they just, maybe when, when, they're an atheist like me and they don't like priests. Okay, well, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, when, a, uh, when a priest has been found guilty of abusing kids in one place and they kept it away from the police because they moved to another territory, another parish, uh, some of these priests have been moved six, eight, ten, twelve times. I would invite you to look at the movie. You don't have time to read 50 books on this. Get the movie called Spotlight. It was about the Boston Globe investigative yeah. story that investigated pedophile priests in Boston. They thought they had three. They found three, and somebody told them that 6% of all priests are pedophiles. So they, they tracked down 87 out of the 90, out of the 1,500 priests in Boston. They found 87 of them. The Catholic Church has a massive problem with that for a variety of reasons that we could talk about in another whole evening. But it's just one of the things where People move from not knowing about something, it's well, you're stepping through the psychological barrier. Once you pass through the barrier and learn that, you can't go back. No. Same thing with 9-11 and some of the others. Once you pass through the barrier and learn it, you can't go back to believing the mythology. David, you got a question? Where does one get that uh, video called Spotlight? That is a movie, uh, an Academy Award winning movie that's available in all libraries right now. You can check it out on libraries. DVD. It's a DVD. You can buy it from Barnes & Noble. I would buy a copy and keep it and then loan it to friends. One best yes. So any other questions or uh, shall we have our speaker? The speaker gets the last word here. Uh, you got a question over there in the corner? Uh, for our speaker, maybe? Is that plastic silver work? For you also, with the Catholic Church syndrome, that just seems like a very, and I say this as, a, as an embittered ex-Catholic. Uh, 
<laughs> Happy Easter, everyone. But <laughs> the notion that is this to suggest that public schools did not molest, did not have employees who molested children in modern times since the founding of public schools? I find that hard to stomach. And also the notion that it's just the priests. There aren't enough of them to go around. There are lots. Shall we say in our modern parlance, closet case nine, a great deal of instruction as well as hired Catholic faculty. Catholic the reason the reason we talk about it in that way, calling it the Catholic Church syndrome, is because it was an organized suppression, not individual cases here and there, but the church knew they had a problem in churches worldwide, and they suppressed it for decades to avoid facing the reality of what causes this problem in the first place. That's why, but that, that, that uh, syndrome, staying on this side of a psychological barrier rather than stepping through it and looking at the evidence. People stay on this side of the barrier and say, well, oh, I don't want to hear about that. I don't know about that. Because if they know about it, they have to do something about it if you have any ethics and morals at all. It's okay? just like saying that 9-11 uh, was an inside job. When you learn the facts, you start believing the government will count, as I'm doing now. So there were no Protestant pedophiles? Uh, of course. Not, 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 not the same percentage. Nobody's ever reported the same percentage in Protestant than that. You ought to do of. some research on that. With okay. right, well, right, you right, can right. do a talk on it, Charlie. I'm going to do a talk on yeah. something else next week. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? But, Andy, what do you know? You know, kind of a parallel. Yeah. What, uh, <clears throat> when you have all of these uh, police officers that are going around shooting people rather than arresting them, um, what would you call that? You say bury, they bury it just the same way as there is the a nationwide, did. There is a nationwide media blackout on the general <laughs> consensus among people that study this that the police okay. in many areas are given free reign just to walk up and blow away a black person. They're not walking up and blowing away white people. Okay. They're murdering black people, unarmed black people. They're not killing a lot of black people that are firing right. at them. Okay. So we have, our speaker, our our speaker needs last to get the last we word. Yeah. We have, this is we're not the time for a debate. Yeah. Uh, come next week with your questions. We'll debate all these things. Okay. All throughout the two-hour stretch. We'll look up Protestant Federal. Again, I want to thank uh, Charlie, Tim, and the College of Complexes for uh, hosting me and everybody for listening. Um, regarding Thomas Jefferson, yes, he's not a libertarian. Uh, I did not mean to give that impression. Uh, I just that to highlight that some of his ideas did influence uh, the libertarian philosophy. Yes, he owned slaves. Uh, not a good thing. He did a lot of other stuff uh, that a lot of libertarians may have issue with. But yes, he was not a libertarian. And even though some claim he is, uh, I believe he's not. Um, Dave mentioned sound money. It's absolutely something that libertarians believe in. Uh, Tim had a uh, was talking about his dollar. Um, without any sort of finite, uh, finite, um, tangible something to back up that dollar, then it is worth nothing. It's just a piece of paper. That's what's been our system now since uh, the 70s. And the Federal Reserve is just basically a private organization that uh, prints off money and loans it to our government and makes it the only tender that we can have. Uh, having such an, uh, a f money that's such, uh, so inflationary is why we can have perpetual war and why we can afford the, the welfare state that we have today. Uh, I, I'm sorry I misunderstood the question about public health. After you explain it, I... I definitely got a better understanding of what you meant. Yes, I think libertarians, uh, even the most pragmatic libertarians on the local level will not be opposed to any sort of uh, sewer or sanitation uh, mechanism. And you're right, uh, we had, you know, those sort of things have made a uh, healthier society and people aren't dying like they used to. Um, Regarding uh, corporations, corporations are legal constructs. Uh, they are, uh, it's basically a piece of paper giving a group of individuals or an individual uh, legal protections, sometimes more than the average citizen would have. Um, I'm not opposed, libertarians generally are not opposed to people coming together and pulling their resources for a certain reason, but uh, corporations 
are legal constructs that are just there to protect the interest of those people who hold that corporation. Um, school districts. Um, there are some really good school districts and there's some really bad school districts. Chicago public schools, depending on the school, has a lot of bad. Uh, and it doesn't do a good job. Uh, high dropout rates. Um, uh, it's in financial shambles. It's just a mismanaged organization. Um, it's an organization that's basically at the whim of the mayor. They don't elect their school board. I think that if we're going to have school boards, they need to be accountable to the people more directly than through a, a central politician. Um, struggle for black uh, for black liberation. Uh, most everywhere you look in in American history where African Americans have been put down, it's usually been because of the state. It was the state that enforced uh, the slavery. It was the state that uh, it was the state that promised slave owners that they would return their their runaway slaves. After slavery was abolished, it was the government who was denying them the right to vote. It was the government who was forcing uh, segregation. Jim Crow is, was a, a uh, definitely, you know, what governments did. Um, so if there's been, uh, you know, just as racism has been a struggle, as you know, has been a thing for black folks to, to overcome, so has been the his history of um, government aggression against uh, the black community. Charlie was mentioning markets and how you know we it was the revolution was people coming together to for freedom not markets uh, I disagree uh, the people who fought through the revolution wanted freer markets these are people who dealt with the India East Company which basically had a monopoly on uh, they were basically the only company that allowed to have any sort of participation in the tea trade it is because of that uh, because of the government protection that they had, it's why the Boston Tea Party happened. So uh, we, and that's that was an example of the mercantilism that even Adam Smith fought against, or even spoke out against. So uh, markets actually, up until that time, had <coughs> haven't really been free, and to a degree, aren't necessarily free today. But um, I think the founding fathers did fight for markets. Uh, as far as Roosevelt, um, yeah, he did. I guess he did a lot of nice things, Social Security, whatever, uh, that people here would enjoy. But he also locked up Japanese Americans. Um, another horrible stain on our history. Um, we could say that I guess you know he seniors don't live in poverty anymore, but at the expense of his Japanese internment. I heard Scandinavia. <laughs> Scandinavia, uh, you mentioned Joe Nor uh, Johan Johan Norberg. Norberg. He actually did an article uh, right before the election in 2016 mm -hmm. saying how the United States actually needed to be more like Scandinavia. And he did not mean that uh, unironically because Scandinavia is a market economy. They, I guess people look up to them as sort of like this socialist utopia, but they have a market economy. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, for the most part, they just have a high taxes in, in, a, in, a, in a welfare state. Uh, they're also geographically smaller, the populations are different, so it, you know it might, and they have a lot of natural resources that they uh, use to fund uh, their, their social safety net. So Joe Norberg uh, argues that we need to have more markets in America if we want to be more like uh, Scandinavia. Uh, the hat, you know, unions, People in Scandinavia are, are a lot of union membership. That's true. Um, I'm not sure how much autonomy unions have in Scandinavia compared to the United States, but at one point in time, unions in the United States were very radical and very antagonistic to the capitalists. And then around the Great Depression, they got neutered and 
became basically one with the government. And if you want to think, if, if, if unions are not strong enough, I would trace that back to the Great Depression when unions colluded with the government. Um, as far as voluntary association, Charlie mentioned uh, workers. So yeah, if workers uh, want to unionize, the uh, owner of a factory or the shop owner not recognizing the union yeah. is actually his right to do so. I mean, freedom association goes both ways. Workers generally do not own the companies they work for. Therefore, they don't. that decision to unionize isn't really theirs. If the uh, voluntary association were to be, you know, a mutually agreed upon agreement would actually be so you voluntary like association. Society. I'm sorry. You like everything hierarchical. Hierarchical. Yeah. Hierarchical. Unions or society. You like society. It's in a hierarchy. Okay. Um, that so is I basically, I think, all I have. I want to thank you guys again. Um. Uh, I think Sanj Mohip, who's running for lieutenant governor, he is here. If you guys want to meet him, I think he's around the corner. Uh, take some of our literature. If you've not signed our petition to be on the ballot, if you guys believe in democracy and want more choices on the ballot, please, please sign our petition. Thank you very much, guys. The movie Spotlight's available on Netflix. Very good. So, you know, you can take a lot of other stuff. I want to, let's uh, get... We're adjourned. All right. Okay. Close to the lieutenant governor.